welcome to the roundup covering what's important to advisors and accountants across the month of April. This month, why is the ATO targeting rental property owners? We'll also look at the new guidance for content creators and the gaps in that guidance. But first up, the guidance from the ATO on claiming running costs for charging electric vehicles. Michael, who does the guidance apply to? And how do you actually apply it? Yeah, the guidance that the ATO has released is basically in recognition of the fact that when it comes to electric vehicles, there is a cost associated with charging those vehicles, and it can be quite difficult in practice to try and figure out what the cost of that electricity is. So this guide is really aimed at individuals who are charging their own electric vehicle at their home and are personally incurring electricity costs in doing that. But this guide is also applicable to employers, employers who are providing car fringe benefits to their employees, potentially taking advantage of the relatively recent exemption under the FBT rules for electric cars. Um, and where those employers are trying to figure out the operating costs of the vehicle under the operating cost method. So this guide is applicable to in some cases, individuals, whether that's an employee or a business person, um, but also to employers who are trying to use the FPT operating cost method. And as I said, it's really about the ATO recognising that difficulty in calculating electricity costs for someone's home. Effectively, what this PCG, and it's only in draft at the moment, what it does is it provides, I guess, a shortcut method for trying to calculate what those electricity costs are. So if you are incurring electricity costs in relation to charging an electric vehicle at your home, um, you can use at the moment a rate of 4.2 cents per kilometre that the vehicle travels. Now, we would expect that over time that, that rate may change. Um, this is an initial rate, and remember it is only a draft PCG. Um, but for the time being, that's the rate that can be used. Now, you don't have to use it, this is optional. Um, if you don't use it, then it's up to you to try and figure out what your actual electricity costs are in connection with charging that vehicle. But as we said, that's practically quite a difficult thing to do. Now, one thing just to mention is that when it comes to who is able to use this rate and who is not able to, um, you are not able to use this shortcut rate if your vehicle is a hybrid vehicle that has an internal combustion engine. So if it's a hybrid vehicle and you also have to fill it up with petrol every now and then, um, this vehicle won't qualify for that rate. Now you may still incur electricity costs in terms of charging that vehicle if it's a plug-in hybrid vehicle, um, but you're kind of left on your own there. You would have to come up with your own number in terms of those electricity costs. The other thing just to note is the start date. This guide, this guideline, this shortcut method um, for FPT purposes applies from the 1st of April 2022. For income tax purposes in terms of claiming deductions, it applies from the 1st of July 2022. So what are the record keeping requirements to use this method? Yeah, so the record keeping requirements are important and it's basically the same as with any of these shortcut methods that the ATO offers. I mean, they can certainly reduce compliance costs and make life a bit easier, but you do need to make sure that you're keeping the right records so that you can take advantage of that shortcut method. In this case, the requirements depend on who you're dealing with, basically. If you're dealing with an individual and they're seeking to claim deductions using that shortcut rate, well, the main thing is they need to keep records of the kilometres that the car or the vehicle has travelled across the relevant period. And for most people, that would mean keeping odometer records. So making sure that you've got odometer records which show distance travelled during the year. Um, if the employee or the individual is using the logbook method, well, they would already have to keep a logbook um, and that would also form part of the record re keeping requirements to use this shortcut method too. Now, if you have an employer and they're seeking to take advantage of this rate when it comes to calculating the operating costs of the vehicle for FPT purposes, um, once again, in order to take advantage of that, you normally need to ensure that the employee has a valid logbook. So once again, that is a requirement that needs to be met to take advantage of this rate. Um, aside from that, the ATO also recognises that because this guide is relatively new, I mean, we didn't know about this back in April 2022, um, there will be people who maybe haven't kept the records yet that are required to be kept to take advantage of this shortcut method. As a result, the ATO says, look, they will provide some flexibility. And so where you haven't kept the required records, particularly, say, an opening odometer reading, then you can make a reasonable estimate using other records. 
And so that may well be service records. For example, you might have taken your car in for a service and in the little book that you keep in the glove box, um, it's got the number of kilometers that the odometer was out at that time. Now that might not be the exact date, but the ATO suggests that using other information, including things like logbooks, you could come up with a reasonable estimate of what the odometer was at the time that you needed to keep those records from. Now, the other thing that we need to be aware of is that this shortcut rate is aimed at people who are incurring electricity costs personally. So clients also need to make sure that they keep a copy of an electricity bill, which shows that they are actually responsible for and are incurring those electricity costs. So the shortcut rate is there in draft form at this stage anyway. We'll certainly let you know once that is finalised and if there are any changes that come through in that, draft ver uh, in that final version. But for the time being, they are the key details. We have clients who want to just make their life a bit easier and use that shortcut method for calculating their electricity costs. Rental property is firmly in the sights of the ATO with a new comprehensive data matching program. Matthew, what's the approach here? Look, the ATO focus on rental property owners um, shouldn't really come as a surprise. Um, the ATO have been saying uh, quite loud and clear and for some time now that rental properties are a key focus area for them. Um, and it seems like there's a good reason for this. There's tax revenue to be collected. In fact, the ATO estimates that there's a tax gap of about a billion dollars due to taxpayers either not reporting or incorrectly reporting their rental property income and deductions. Um, so in that light, um, and turning to your question, the ATO have launched a new data matching program um, targeting rental properties. It's gonna be collecting uh, data from quite a few banks for the 2022 year onwards. Um, and it's gonna be collecting um, information specifically on residential rental property loans. So things like details of account holders, um, things like um, interest charge during the year, uh, repayments during the year, as well as other transactions within a particular loan account. Now, because the data set is expected to involve um, 1.7 million uh, taxpayers, uh, the expectation, which shouldn't come as a surprise, is that we're gonna see more scrutiny um, in this area um, due to this data matching program. And I think the ATO are gonna be a bit more rigorous around ensuring taxpayers are lodging their rental schedules when they need to. And now that they're collecting the data on this, ensuring that taxpayers aren't overclaiming interest deductions on their rental properties. So is there something that the ATO seems to be particularly concerned about here? That's a really good question. Um, as I said, uh, the ATO estimates there's a $1 billion tax gap here. And the ATO have, have come out to explicitly say that one of the common reasons for this, not the only reason for this, is that taxpayers aren't apportioning their interest deductions when they redraw or they refinance their rental property loans for a private purpose. And what I really mean by that is that when you're looking at whether interest deductions are available, um, primarily this depends on the use of the borrowed funds. If someone borrows an amount um, to acquire a residential rental property to generate accessible rent, then we'll often find that we'll be able to claim interest deductions on that loan. If that loan's been uh, redrawn on or refinanced so that there's an additional borrowing, then we need to look at how those additional borrowings have been used. Uh, to the extent those additional borrowings have been used to buy things that have nothing to do with generating accessible income, uh, for example, to buy lifestyle assets, then in a way that loan's been, been tainted. And there's gonna be a portion of interest deductions on that loan that won't be deductible. And in cases where a loan has been refinanced or redrawn on for a private purpose, the ATO is concerned. They're concerned that taxpayers aren't appropriately apportioning their interest deductions. And it's really up to us um, to be asking our clients the right questions um, when we see clients with interest expenses on their rental properties. And we should really be asking things like, um, have you refinanced? Um, have you redrawn on that loan? And if so, um, what have you used those additional funds for? The role of content creators has escalated dramatically over the last few years. Every month on the Knowledge Shop Help Desk, we get a myriad of questions, particularly dealing with OnlyFans. Now, the ATO have released new guidance on the tax treatment for content creators. Michael, what's the issue here and what is the ATO's intent? Yeah, look, the ATO has released this guide and look, it is a very brief guide. 
um, which is basically trying to warn people who receive benefits, whether that's cash, um, goods, other property, in relation to content that they might create and then make available to the public or a section of the public. And so that could include people who may be uh, writing blogs and receiving benefits for that, um, people who are creating video content and receiving either a regular subscription fee income or receiving tips and gratuities and other benefits. It could include people who have, say, YouTube channels and are receiving goods or benefits, things to try out and review as part of their channel. Um, it can include a whole range of things. And I guess what the ATO is concerned about, and this is my guess anyway, is that a lot of people in this situation may not be fully compliant with their tax obligations. And maybe they feel that what they're receiving is very hard for the ATO to track, and therefore it's easier just to leave it out. And the ATO, I think, is producing this guide as a way of reminding people that it's not quite as simple as that. Now, basically what the ATO is suggesting, and the, the message is pretty brief and pretty simple, is that if you are receiving money or goods in relation to content that you create, then you will probably be taxed on that. And I guess one of the things that the ATO um, mentions, and I think this is a really valid point, is if you're creating content and you're receiving something other than cash, um, that could be creating some cash flow problems for you. Because if you receive expensive items, the market value of those items might end up being included in your taxable income, and you may end up with a pretty hefty tax bill, but you don't necessarily have the cash to pay that tax. So that is one of the things that I think from a practical perspective, the ATO is right on the money there, that there will be people out there who are receiving things often in non-cash form, and there's an issue there in terms of can they afford to pay the tax without selling the things that they've received. Now, the other thing that the ATO mentions quite briefly is GST. Um, if you are receiving benefits in relation to creating content, and that relates to an enterprise that you're carrying on, then you may well hit a point where you need to register for GST. And there may well then be a GST liability that arises in relation to the benefits that you receive. Again, whether they're in cash form or in the form of goods or property. Um, so it can be a pretty tricky area, and particularly for those people who aren't just receiving cash, um, determining the value of what they've received and making sure that all ends up in the tax return and in GST calculations um, can, to some extent, be just a little bit more complex than what, what you might think. But the ATO's clear message is pretty clear here. If you're receiving something for the content you create, then in many cases, there will be some sort of tax obligation that you will need to meet. Are there things that we should be making our clients aware of that the ATO haven't necessarily covered in their guidance? Yeah, there's two things that really come to mind to you. The first one is that the ATO seems to make what I think is a pretty blanket statement that if you're creating content and you're receiving something in relation to that, that, that will probably be taxed. Now, I think the reality is a bit more complex than that. Because if you are undertaking something that is a genuine hobby, you don't expect to make any money from it. Um, and someone happens to give you, for example, an unsolicited gift, I'm not sure that that is always going to be taxable. I think the situation is more complex and that would require more detailed analysis. Now, if someone is creating content with the expectation of generating a profit, they're going to receive things, whether it's cash or goods, uh, with a value that exceed the expenses incurred, or if this is basically their full-time occupation, I think it's pretty valid that, yes, we would expect that to be a taxable activity, may well be a business. But there might be clients who are receiving things occasionally on an ad hoc basis where you might be able to argue that that is not taxable to them. It will really depend on the situation. I don't think that's something that's really covered in the ATO guide. The second thing is that the ATO refers to GST obligations, but what we've seen come up quite a lot in practice is, again, it's more complex because if you're receiving things from overseas, from foreign residents, foreign parties, it may well be that the supply that you are making is GST free. Again, those, those rules are a bit more complex than I, I guess maybe what you might understand in terms of seeing what's in the ATO guide. So where you have clients, particularly those who are getting towards that $75,000 turnover threshold for GST registration, um, particularly important to focus on where the money, where the goods are coming from. Because if they are receiving subscription fees, cash, goods from overseas, there may well be scope to treat 
that as GST free under the export rules. Um, but those rules will need to be looked at in a fair bit of detail. But that is something we've seen come up quite a lot, particularly for people who are creating content, which is uploaded onto say video sharing platforms. Uh, often, in many cases, those people will be receiving at least some of their income from overseas, and they may well be scoped to apply those export rules. So they're two things that come to mind. They're not really discussed in the ATO's guide. It is very brief. Um, but they are issues that we see in practice and that really need practitioners to look at in more detail. And that's the roundup for this month. The federal budget is coming up on 9th of May, as you well know. If you're on Knowledge Shop's database, we'll send you our advisor edit of all the things that are relevant to accountants and advisors the morning after the federal budget. If you're not on our database at the moment, just jump onto knowledgeshop.com.au and just register for that budget update. If your firm is not a member of Knowledge Shoppers yet and you'd like to see exactly how we're helping thousands of accountants across the country every single day, then give the team a call. We'd love to show you how we can make a difference to your practice. We'll look forward to talking to you soon.